You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. Super Bowl, Women's Euro, Formula One Miami Grand Prix, UEFA Euro, Major League Baseball in London, the NFL in London, and soon Germany. That's just a taste of some of the world famous events where today's guest, Matt Lynch of Moonshot, helped ensure a fantastic fan experience. Partnering with those world famous brands, Matt and his team equipped the frontline teams at those events, both volunteer and employee to deliver a fan experience worthy of those events. Matt brings experience from the Walt Disney Company early in his career, influencing his view on customer, guest, fan, you name it, experience. Beyond the mouse, Matt shaped fan experience inside of Major League Baseball, the College Football Hall of Fame, and the iconic Wembley Stadium in the UK. What intrigued me about Matt is most of this experience delivery is done through others, through those employees and armies of volunteers at these events. If you've got a company where you're wondering how to equip and excite your team to deliver great customer experience, you'll want to learn from Matt today. It's taken a while for Matt and me to connect because he has been all over the globe lately. That kind of global experience collection warms this host's heart. When I spoke with Matt last, he was enjoying a well-deserved holiday in northern Spain. It's almost like Matt could be the poster child for CX Passport, all about customer experience with a dash, or in Matt's case... A heavy helping of travel. Today will be fun. Matt, welcome to CX Passport. How you doing, Rick? Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be on. And I know we've been uh, trying to make this happen for a good while. It has. But all that means is that it's just going to be even that much more satisfying. Just like a meal delayed or an experience delayed, here we had the chance to finally have it. And listeners, I know it's an audio-only podcast, but I will tell you that Matt already, as his background, has the 2022 NFL kickoff and the training associated with that as his background. So even as I'm looking at Matt today, he has got the next great event already queued up. But Matt, exactly, all of those amazing events, all those great fan experiences, before we get into it, I'd love for you just to start off by giving us a sense, give the listeners a sense of what does Moonshot do? Yeah, we're really a a frontline staff training and engagement company. And we probably work on, you know, five or six projects a year, uh, working with organizations that really understand that their frontline is their connection to their fan or their guest or uh, whoever their customer is. And so we uh, we look for those organizations that want to really empower and drive purpose in their front line. And, and we work with those organizations and we're really lucky to do what we do. And we, like you said, we get to uh, travel a lot. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. probably this last year after the pandemic has been more travel than I've, I've ever had. And I think even when I worked at the Atlanta Braves, you know, and didn't travel at all in my position there, you know, you think, oh, it'd be great to travel. And then you start traveling and you're thinking, <laughs> oh, man, this is, you know, I'm on a plane. I, I was on a plane once um, going to uh, to Miami for Super Bowl uh, training there. And uh, on the plane back, which was like a day or two later, I had the same crew and they were like, they looked at me, I was sitting in the same seat. And they looked at me like, hold on a second, weren't you on the plane over? <laughs> you know, I was really only in Miami for 24 hours and I live in London. And they looked at me and I looked at them and it was it was bizarre. But uh, yeah, this last year has been been quite a a, a wild ride of, of travel for uh, for work and, and connecting with, you know, the our clients who really have that connection and understand and not a lot do that the front line is their their brand or their product or their emotional connection. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's really what we're all about. We're all about the frontline staff. And like you said, we understand that that's who's really making that connection. And, and so we focus on that. I think that's you said something there that's pretty interesting. And that is 
certain brands, certain teams, certain entities have recognized that. And that's true, not just in the fan experience world, but in any sort of customer experience world. And what I love is that those who have recognized it do create those great experiences. And and we'll continue to talk more about that, although I did have a chuckle as you're describing that. And I realized I didn't mention to the listeners, in spite of Matt's very U.S. accent, I'm talking to Matt in the U.K. right now. So when he's talking about all this travel, it's from London to Miami. It's from London to other parts of the world. He is definitely all over the world. And that would be some but kind of a surreal experience to see the same crew. And I can imagine they gave you that furrowed eyebrow of, what? Did, did you leave the plane? What's wrong here? Uh, do you really, really enjoy uh, flying across the water so much? But I imagine that was a, a, a bit of a surreal experience to even not have a jet lag for that moment. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've never had that experience before, and I don't probably think they've had that either. We had the same passenger in the same seat. You know, they have their day off, and then they're back on the plane yeah. again, and the same passengers back there, ready to go back home or wherever they're going to next. <laughs> Let's talk about that that uh, delivery of the experience, and it is through those armies of volunteers. And and I really want people to really sit here and think about how many volunteers it takes to create a great experience for something, even for a solo NFL game, but imagine for a, a, a the Women's Euro with all of those amounts of people. And we're talking about these multiple event locations. So how are you helping create this quality fan experience when it is so distributed and so reliant on that huge volume of frontline volunteers? Yeah, I mean, there there is definitely a formula for it. And, and I learned that formula back, you know, when I was 19 years old and went to work at the Walt Disney Company as a, a college program intern. And, you know, first day, and I tell this story, actually, in a lot of my training to volunteers or frontline staff, and they say, we don't want to talk about what your functional role is going to be of running a ride or picking up trash or whatever it is that you do at the Walt Disney Company. We want to talk about what your purpose is here and and how you can create this experience for our guests that spend a lot of money and travel very long distances to come to Walt Disney World, you know, and it is very purpose driven. And so that's something I learned then. And it is something that has been a part of um, my career when I work within organizations to drive, um, you know, drive experience or drive emotional connections or, or delivering on those. Uh, but now, you know, de and developing programs for other groups, you know, volunteering, large major events, the NFL, Major League Baseball, it is about purpose. It's That's what people want. You know, I know purpose is a big word now and a lot of people use it, but it's it's real. It's real and, and people want to be purpose driven. And especially in the volunteering world, people are looking for a number of things. They want to create connections with other people. They want to build their you know, build their network, but they want purpose. They want they want to have a purpose in what they're doing. And and so our programs are very much driven by purpose. And we work with our clients to define what that purpose is. You know, sometimes it's very focused on what the tournament was all about, like at the women's Euros. You know, this was about legacy. This yeah. was about legacy. And and actually it was like a movie how how the women's Euros played <laughs> out yeah. this year uh with England winning the tournament. It was um, based in England. You know, the tournament was hosted here in England, and we were working uh, for the FA and and uh, UEFA to get volunteers ready to be purpose driven. First, be purpose driven, then then learn all the other things that are important to the experience when it comes to the um, the guest or the fan or or the visitor, whoever you are engaging with. And volunteers are everywhere. They're on the city yeah. streets. They're at the stadium. They're everywhere. So you just never know what type of question you're going to get asked. Uh, but again, if you're purpose driven, you're you're going to deliver uh, the, that experience for whoever it is you uh, run into that might just be looking for the train station or maybe they're looking for the stadium. But yeah. you just don't know. And so it's very much important, very important to fo focus them on a, more of a purpose than than a functional role of, you know, you're going to be a, a wayfinder here on the corner of, uh, you know, wherever heading to the train station, that type of thing. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. 
Love it if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now, sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. I, and that, I would imagine that purpose part of it, obviously inspiration that you're describing there, but elevating above exactly that, that it's not just this tactical function. Uh, hello, guest. Hello, fan. Hello, traveler from another country. Here's how you get to the train station. Thank you. Check. But instead, in your own mind, thinking, I have just helped this person be a part of this larger event, this a part of this special story that is being created collectively across the Women's Euro, for example, or even an individual game, the story that is created, that volunteer is helping that come together. And it reminds me all the way back in high school. So uh, I I was a runner. I guess I still am a runner, but I don't really do a lot of events anymore. My knees don't really like that anymore. But I wasn't old enough to run a half marathon in Austin, Texas. They actually had age limits back then, if you can believe it. Clearly not the case now. And so I wanted to be a part of the half marathon there in Austin. It had just gotten started. And because running was a part of my life, I enjoyed the chance to participate. It was fun. I don't remember a whole lot. Like I mentioned, it's high school. It was a long time ago. But it was a lot of fun. The fun is what I remember. And I was just one high school kid, but you're dealing with thousands of volunteers that you're trying to inspire and excite and be on purpose. I'm sure you just want them to have some fun. So when they have a great experience, they can deliver a great fan experience. How do you create that great experience for those volunteers so it's fun or delightful or insightful or uh, – purpose driven what does that look like yeah and i mean I, you know we pay a, we play a small role in the bigger volunteer experience but we do play an important role uh of of designing and delivering the usually the first time all the volunteers come together you know and sometimes it's you know it's called a kickoff sometimes it's called a you know a, a rally some you know it's called different uh -huh. things but you know the first time they all come together uh, it's important that we do create that experience, that we're giving those warm welcomes when they arrive, that the space itself is comfortable. And we we often, if we don't talk about it, we definitely are thinking about it, is we look at the, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? right. So what, what are those basic things that um, these people are going to need? So we get, we get those, those, you know, the, our safety and, you know, water and, yeah. and restroom <laughs> the facilities, yeah. the basics, right? Because nobody feels comfortable yeah. in these types of environments if you don't know that the basics are covered already. Uh, and then we bring a lot of fun. We bring a lot of fun. You know, we use this tool called Mentimeter. It's a oh, it's yeah. a quiz. It's a quiz tool. We use it every, I mean, we just used it at kickoff training for the NFL on Saturday night, you know, just to bring a little bit of fun, get people relaxed. But the tool also brings a lot of other ways of gathering feedback, live feedback during mm -hmm. the session. Like what how do you think that you can be purpose driven as a volunteer and the, their feedback pops up on the screen? And so you have live live feedback going on. So you got to bring the fun. You have to also make sure that each one of them knows that although they're volunteering and they're giving their their time for free, that they do have a role to play. They have a functional role, but also we want them to be purpose driven. So just because you're given your free time doesn't mean that you don't have an important role mm -hmm. in the overall, uh, you know, the overall um, tournament or the experience or whatever it is. So bringing fun to their experience is really important. And we did that. I mean, I think in the women's euros training, we had a number of different challenges going on throughout the session. They had individual challenges, they had team challenges. And so we really wanted to bring that teamwork and build connections with other people and problem solving and create something where they left at the end of the day. And they said, you know, that was a lot of fun. I met so many new people. Mm -hmm. Now I have people that I can connect with, which we often say in our sessions, like it, this is the time now to meet a couple of people that you can rely on when you show up here for your first shift, because we all do as humans, we want to have connections with other people, especially when you're in a volunteering environment, know a couple of people that you can make eye contact with and you can, you know, feel a bit more comfortable in your space. Cause you know, some people, you know, Jane, or you know, Jim, or uh, you can go over and say, Hey, how are you? Cause you met them in training and yeah. now you feel a bit more comfortable around them and maybe they're on your team. And now you're out now in an environment 
where you're serving other people and you're and you're helping other people and you just feel a bit more comfortable and when we all feel more comfortable in our environments then we can we actually can create connections with other people but if we don't feel comfortable uh it is very much and it is very more difficult to to do that i like that the the idea of your basics your fun and your comfort level so that you've built those connections. And that's got to translate then into the fan experience. And and I've been to events like this. It is amazing, these armies of volunteers, how they are some of the most uh, upbeat people and how they contribute, like truly contribute to my overall experience that that was fun because that person that guided me from parking lot to entrance was a lot of fun. And yeah, there's been times that I've had the alternate experience where you're like, why is this salty person here? This is not the place for you. But it exactly that. And I have to imagine that what you're describing, the basics, the the fun, the comfort, the connection, all that translates into their ability, their ease in then being able to provide a great fan experience. Yeah, I completely agree. It's making people feel comfortable, showing a bit of kindness and appreciation. Kindness, yeah. And, and, and it goes a long way. You can't expect them to be kind and, and, and connect with other people when you're not connecting with them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so much that you and I are talking about fan experience, but I know listeners are sitting there, even if they're not in the fan experience space going exactly employee experience. If I have a contact center, if I have a sales staff, if I have whatever, even a financial uh, a finance team, if I've created a great experience for those employees, they in turn can then create a great experience for their customers. And the reverse is true as well. If I haven't created that environment, they're not going to be able to do so. Now, it's one thing to talk about this in the ivory tower aspect and and all the companies that are hiring you, that are bringing you in these massive sports and entertainment brands, they want that experience to be a great one. And if you just came in and dropped a few CX platitudes on them, some employee experience nuggets and in this ivory tower, theoretical boardroom type style, yeah, that's one th- that's one approach and we've probably seen it. But you get dirty. You actually get down there in the operations. You're that operationally focused. How do you get out of the boardroom and really into those front lines? Yeah, I mean, we're really lucky on most of our projects. We are on the front line. So it's not just about going in there and delivering the training and disappearing. Yeah. Um, it is very much when you're on the front line, you know, I think the term Chick-fil-A uses a lot. It's about servant leadership. And I think that's what it's all about. You know, it's all about getting down there. It's about um, being a part of their experience, making sure that you're checking in on them and, you know, you're, you're managing some of those Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, just little small stuff that really make a big difference. Uh, So it is important for us and and our team and, and, and a lot of organizations, you know, they, they will do the training, they will then be finished we sometimes in our projects do that because that's what the client wants Mm. but we'd much rather be on the ground uh, when the tournament's going on or at the super bowl or at the mlb london series or, or whatever the event is and be a part of the volunteer experience or be a part of the frontline experience i mean at super bowl every single year since we started working on that back at super bowl 53 in atlanta we are on the ground at two o'clock in the morning, usually mm. Super Bowl Sunday morning. We're the first people there to welcome our first teammates to the stadium. And that's that's a big deal. That's a big yeah. deal. You know, you have chefs coming in that are coming to prep all the food mm-hmm. for the fans that won't be eating for 10 hours from then. And you're there to welcome they, them, say good morning. Can I get you a cup of coffee? There's somebody from the NFL, us, and the NFL understands exactly why that's so important. Uh, and again, why we work with certain clients and some clients we don't work with because it is that intention to detail when it comes to the the staff experience, the frontline uh, teammate experience, knowing yeah. that, yes, we need to be there at two o'clock in the morning to say good morning, have a cup of coffee or some donuts there for these these staff that actually probably won't ever see uh, a fan today because they'll be behind yeah. the scenes. They'll be in the kitchens. They'll be in the security areas. They'll be down a, a dark concourse. Yeah. Uh, but the, the the NFL know how important that role is because everybody uh, counts and everybody has an impact on the fan experience. No matter if you're you're there at the gates when Super Bowl fans start to arrive, or if you're in the kitchen prepping that food. So, you know, they these things matter. Being on the ground, being front line, um, showing that that you're there. And you're there to support in whatever way you need to support 
uh, is, is what we're all about. That we could almost do an entire episode, maybe an entire series about what you said there, because not only are you talking about that employee leader, uh, employee experience and showing that you're there for the volunteers and that you're participating and you're down there. You're not just sitting up in some office, some HQ kind of thing, but you're there involved. You're in the front lines. But then that other thread that exists in there of even if they never see a fan and helping them understand how their experience, their prepping of the food and what is going to be consumed later is so vital to fan experience, even if they never see or interact with a fan. I, I, I love that part of it and helping because we, we talk about it a lot, helping non-customer facing roles understand their impact on the overall customer experience. You're doing it right there in every event, being able to provide that employee experience for a, a role that may never, ever see a fan. You mentioned being there at two in the morning, and I imagine there's been a lot of times that you've been there at two in the morning. And so as we joked about that, it's taken us a while to connect. And we finally did connect when you took five weeks in northern Spain. Five weeks. That sounds amazing. I would love to just sit here and think about how relaxing, hopefully that was, after all of these events, all these 24-hour trips to Miami. Tell me what it was like. Tell me what northern Spain was like to spend five weeks there. It's lovely. I mean, it's, you know, uh, again, it's something I can do because of the the work that I do in, in um, you know, in my everyday um, purpose driven life that I can then go spend, you know, five weeks in Spain. And, and here in England, it's very different from the U.S. when it comes to kids uh, summer schedule. So my kids, my two boys only get six weeks of summer holiday. Okay. So we spend, and we have really since I left Wembley five years ago, we've spent every summer in Spain. And uh, I still work, try to work from there. And, you know, it's uh, to set the scene, it's this very small village. It's called Crochet. Uh, it probably has, uh, you know, 20 houses that are all connected. Uh, yeah. It's in a valley. No one speaks English. Uh, everyone speaks huh. Catalan. So we work through that. Our neighbors deliver us. Uh, vegetables almost every morning from their oh, wow. allotment, uh, you know, tomatoes and peppers and, and other vegetables that we, we will eat that night. You can have a completely different diet. You know, it, we, you know, we eat so many olives and we, it's it just, it's just a completely different uh, lifestyle for about five weeks. And um, it's in a, my, my in-laws have a kind of this farmhouse that is one of these houses that are connected to these other 20 houses um, and so we have more space to kind of have our own space because in London, our flat, uh, which I'm in right now is probably like 580 square feet. Yeah. So, you know, and there's four of us. And so <laughs> having a bit of space, it's, uh, it's sunny every day. Oh my gosh, uh, that sounds awesome. It's, it's, it's just very different. And so, uh, we, we very much enjoy it and we drive there. Uh, so we drove, you know, you go across the, uh, the, the Euro tunnel underneath the, um, the channel and, uh, then drive the le whole length of France. And then, uh, we're about an hour inside of the Spanish border, just about an hour and a half North of Barcelona. So it is, it is very different. There's no doubt about it. And we're now back and I'm looking out the window here and it's, it's cloudy here in London. Um, and I, <laughs> I didn't see many clouds when I was in Spain. That sounds just spectacular. After a trip like that, you know, a lot of times I talk to guests that, you know, a trip like that, you need some time in the first class lounge. You were basically in a first class lounge for five weeks. It sounds wonderful. But I imagine on some of your other travels, <laughs> heck, that Miami trip or any of the others, there's probably some time that you'd like to escape and get into the first class lounge. So, yes, let's take that moment here. Join me here in the first class lounge. We'll move quickly and have a little bit of fun. What is a dream travel location from your past? I'd probably go back to Italy. I mean, we, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Santorini, I love it. We actually just bought a, a, a house in Italy that's, you know, one of those old places that needs a complete rehab. So we're hoping to spend more time in Italy, but Italy, uh, you know, Santorini down there in the south is just, is just beautiful. That sounds fantastic. Italy is one of my favorites. Uh, we did a we did a little thing in a group that I was in, and it was, you know, if money were no object, where would you be? And 
almost universally, it was about 80% said Italy, mostly Tuscany, but just Italy in general, people were wanting to, to end up there. What is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? Uh, it's going to be Australia for me. And okay. it's been, uh, my wife went there, uh, she did a, a round the world trip when we were much younger before we got married. So she went off and, and did it and went to Australia and spent many weeks in Australia. But yeah, I think Australia is, is, uh, kind of where, where that trip would be. And, and hopefully, uh, that that will happen. And I'm hoping to, they will eventually get a client down there to work yeah. with, or if not, we'll, we'll have to go, um, we'll have to go you know, eventually, but yeah, that Australia is, is, is the place for me. We'll try to see if we can get this, uh, podcast amplified in Australia. See, uh, get some Australian rules, football interested in moonshot, right? What is a favorite thing to eat? Well, I mean, I've been in Spain for the last five <laughs> weeks and, right. and I, you know, hamon, which is ham. Mm. I mean, it's just off the chain and, and olives and, you know, they have special potato chips there that we, I just had some, actually we brought some back with us. I just had some right before I got on this, uh, the podcast. So it is a, a, a favorite of, of mine right now. Um, but otherwise it's pasta. I love, I love pasta. My gosh, it is only nine o'clock in the morning here in the U S where I'm recording you. And now you've made me so hungry <laughs> for those kind of foods. This is, I always make a mistake in recording this podcast when I'm hungry. Maybe this will help. What is a thing your parents forced you to eat, but you hated as a kid? This is very easy. Uh, and I tell my kids about this all the time. And they ask me to stop telling them about it. But my mom, <laughs> my mom's from Ireland. She okay. grew up in a, a thatched house, which she oh, showed wow. us when we were younger. And I think it was like every Tuesday night or Wednesday night, we used to have liver wrapped in bacon. Oh, and oh. And I still have nightmares about that liver wrapped in bacon i mean the bacon's nice that's <laughs> where you need but, a pet take that bacon off and just feed the liver to a pet right yeah there's no question that oh, it was gosh. the liver wrapped in bacon that was the worst thing but you know that that my mom i'm sure i've never asked her i'm sure it was a you know a delicacy in her house when right. she was growing up in ireland and yeah you know. and 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 again, it's an audio podcast, but for the listeners, I can tell you that Matt almost had sort of this ashen look on his face as he was recalling the memories. So it definitely brings back some uh, some interesting memories. My mom was a liver and onions fan. Now, she didn't force it on us, but I, I'm, I'm glad to see that that has fallen out of favor. I don't know a lot of folks that are having that dish anymore. With all of your travels, Matt, what is that one travel item, not including your phone, that you will not leave home without? Yeah, this is an easy one too. I mean, I've always struggled. I'm six two. I've always struggled to sleep on on planes, but I've I think I've finally figured out how to do it. And it's a sleep mask for me. You know, sleep mask and and ear, uh, you know, ear uh, buds that go into your ear, and uh, uh, that usually works. So I, I yeah, I don't I do not leave London on an international flight if I do not have my my sleep mask. Matt, you had this experience that has given you this just wide, this deep wealth of understanding of what makes a great fan experience. But that's the past. It's the present. But things change. Desires change. Ideas change. Actual experiences differ, even in the same event for a particular fan. So I'm curious, how do you capture that voice of the fan, both to know that the experience delivered was a great one, but then also what other ideas your fans might have for how you can improve their experience in the future? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I had this conversation uh, a few days ago with um, a potential client mm -hmm. about who our customer is to a certain extent. And, you know, we have a client, we work with a client, but really our customer is the volunteer or frontline staff member. Okay. Then their customer or their client is the, the customer, the actual fan. Sometimes we have that straight connection right to the fan, but usually it's it's the we're kind of that in between group that's working with a frontline staff member, then then has the opportunity to have the impact on the the end fan. And I think usually for us, uh, and, and in some instances, you know, our clients are measuring these things. The NFL measures, you know, these things. Right. You know, what impact our teammates? which what we call our staff, our frontline staff and for NFL events, 
what impact are they having? And so they, you know, they do surveys with with fans at the Super Bowl or Pro Bowl or the draft to look at certain behaviors. You know, are our teammates delivering on engagement or friendliness or knowledge? These types of things that we know are important for uh, the overall fan experience in that in that uh, event. You know, every event is very different. Like I said, the women's Euros was very much about legacy. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of our key focus for our volunteers is how are you going to leave your legacy on this tournament through your actions and behaviors for that connection that you're going to have with that that kid who never thought about maybe playing football, either a girl or a boy. And now they're thinking, hey, maybe I, I'll try this now. Maybe yeah. I'll go join my lo- local uh, team. So really for us, it's about listening. You know, we work in England a lot in volunteering and we run into a lot of the same volunteers and they will give you feedback if you ask them. And I think getting that feedback from them, asking them, how could we have you know, delivered a better session from a training perspective? How could we be, been better leaders? What could your leaders be doing to um, help and resource you and give you the tools you need to, to do and deliver on a great experience? I think that's what what we do and try to capture again it's not it's not always something that can be put into some type of metric yeah um yes. but again it just depends on where we're where we fit into the uh overall operational um model whether or not we're actually talking directly to a, a customer or we're talking to a staff member who then has that connection with uh with a customer but i think you know listening having conversations are still so important and you know maybe you know, won't have a metric that pops out of that but you definitely will have some some opportunities for improvement two things there well actually more than two but so, two that I'm going to mention here that really hit me in what you said there is if we ask them they'll give us feedback and i think so many companies i'm just going to use the generic word companies fail to engage their front line in your case the volunteers the employees the ones that are out there on the front lines but fail to engage them because guess who knows the end customer best the front line and for some reason that is a treasure trove of information customer insights that is just not tapped into so you saying the phrase if we ask them they give the feedback absolutely so creating those moments or those processes if it's repeatable to where you can get that and 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 that just that particularly really sits with me and the second thing was yeah maybe you can't get a metric on it exactly i think there's so much obsession over a number and a metric because it's easy to put up on a chart and people can look at it and now it went up yay it goes down cry you know but the richness comes from the the non-metric insight and the conversations that are had and what you're learning from that Matt, I, I love ending on that. We're actually out of time. I can't believe it. There's so much more that I'd want to ask you about. But I do want to close by just asking, how can people get to know more about Moonshot? How can people get to know you? What's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, I mean, we're really active on LinkedIn. Um, so uh, Moonshot, just search us uh, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, or our website is uh, www.mshot.co, just .co, because we're running out of .coms in this day and age. So right. uh, yeah, mshot.co uh, is a great way to connect with us. And um, yeah, we, uh, again, are very, very purpose-driven organization and we work on projects with clients that are also very purpose-driven and that's that's what we're all about. Awesome. Matt, I'll get all that in the show notes. So listeners, you don't have to stop down and take a note, just scroll down and take a look and you can click right through there and get access to Moonshot and learn more. Matt, thank you so much for the insights you shared. Thank you for helping me learn a little bit more about fan experience and a little bit of twinge of jealousy when it comes to these really, really cool events that you have been associated with. But the real jealousy comes from the thought of that wonderful five-week experience there in Northern Spain. Just sounds delightful. Matt, thank you so much for your time on CX Passport today. Rick, thanks so much uh, for chasing me down and us connecting. It's been great, a great experience. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. Make sure to visit our website, cxpassport.com, where you can hit subscribe so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, you can check out the rest of the ex for cx website. If you're looking to get real about customer experience, ex for cx is available to help you increase revenue by starting to listen to your customers and create great experiences for every customer, every time. Thanks for listening to CX Passport and be sure to tune in for our next episode. Until next time, 
I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. 